Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Peter. You can also call me Meyer, uh, and I'm one of your TFs. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for section here on uh, Wednesday, the 27th of June. Uh, we're going to be talking about HTTP, DNS, and PHP. Um, so how far did David get in lecture? Did he um, all get all the way to talking about the git super global dollar underscore git? Did he talk about that? Did he talk about dollar underscore or, uh, sorry, post? Mentioned it. Yeah, OK. What about um, dollar underscore session? You mentioned it. OK, cool. Good. Um, so we'll cover some of this stuff today. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to point point out just a few things about HTTP and, and DNS. I'm using this new uh, presentation tool, Prezi. Um, so uh, we'll give this a whirl. I don't have very many slides, but um, first of all, uh, all of my sections will have uh, code that's available at this content link. Um, so if you go to this link, and I'll make the, this Prezi available as well, you'll be able to find the code, any code that we do today. Um, so the code will be in this folder. And, uh, and you can email me at this email, pnori at fast.harvard.edu. So first of all, um, let's talk about HTTP and DNS. Um, DNS, I uh, is did he did he give much time to DNS? Did David spend much time talking about DNS at all? Yeah, yeah he did. Okay, cool. He so he talked about how um, it every DNS request goes to your local ISP, and then if your local ISP doesn't know what the the uh, domain name for, or what the IP address is for a given domain name, then it goes to the root name server all the way up to a .com name server for uh, Prezi.com. Um, so uh, then if he covered DNS pretty well, um, then we can spend some more time talking about hypertext transfer protocol. So like, um, like uh, any protocol, um, I, I find it interesting to think about protocols uh, by thinking about CB radios. Back in the 70s, they used to have these radios in every car. And uh, there's kind of a protocol for how you announced yourself to the people that were around you, like to the vehicles that were around you that had CB radios in those vehicles. And uh, so if you go check out the uh, voice procedures on Wikipedia. There are certain keywords like affirm, negative, over, out. And there are certain times when you can say those keywords. And uh, HTTP is the same way. There are certain, there are certain keywords uh, inside the header. And uh, there are certain places at which certain keywords are able to occur. Um, and you can see, you can see these uh, these uh, headers in progress later on in this term. We'll talk about how to how to see the v, the raw HTTP headers as they they head across the internet um, in order to see what's actually happening with uh, your AJAX requests. Um, so it's a protocol, which is just a uh, a set of conventions with vocabulary and a method for using that vocabulary. And it's also stateless, which means that every time information is sent and received once, the information is discarded. Um, so we need cookies and session management, like the dollar sign underscore session, in order to make anything appear persistent. Um, and what that means is that when you request a web page, 
uh, like let's say you go to Netflix.com and you see your, your home page on Netflix, uh, if you were to go to another page on Netflix, the only way that they're able to know that you are still you and not somebody else is by using this simulated uh, persistence with session management and cookies uh, and information st stored on the server. So um, the web page is created on the server by, uh, in, in, it's initiated with a browser request. The browser sends an, an HTTP header that contains uh, an address, like this one could be prezi.com slash, you know, this big long address, and then all of these key value pairs. And then Apache finds the appropriate page to render. And when, once it's found the appropriate PHP file that's going to process when the URL uh, actually is delivered, then it processes the PHP that's in that file. And that file returns HTML after interacting with one or more databases. This could be MySQL, it could be a CSV file, it could be XML that's stored on the server, it could be a flat file database. Um, we'll deal with a lot of these different circumstances throughout the course. And then after processing the PHP, it returns the HTML back to the browser. Um, so if you can think about Apache as being these kind of purplish pink things in here, that will actually uh, clarify, clarify your mind as we try to um, debug our programs. Um, so that's pretty much all I have with Prezi. Um, let's get started with uh, some examples. So I'm going to be using a previous version of the CS50 appliance that we'll be using in this class. Um, we're still updating the appliance, so uh, once it's officially released, then you'll be able to download this computer within a computer and run it within a hypervisor on your computer. A hypervisor is a program that runs a computer within a computer. If you've never run uh, a virtual machine on your computer, it'll be kind of a, um, a brain stretch the very first time. Uh, it's it's almost like a, a simulation of a CPU that's running its own operating system. And uh, we've stored in a large file that's over one gigabyte in size um, a setup environment that includes a server and a development environment if you want to use Linux. Um, and that's the environment that you'll be using. Yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, can, can I run it inside VMware? So the question is, um, if you are already familiar with VMware, can you run it inside VMware? That's quite probably true. Previous versions did work in VMware. I think for Windows, the preferred method is actually to use VMware right now. So that'll probably work just fine. Um, because I'm not responsible for developing the next version of the appliance, I can't say for sure which hypervisors it'll support. Um, but I think that that's a fairly reasonable guess. Uh, and they've deployed it onto multiple hypervisors in the past, to VirtualBox and to VMware. Uh, so you should be able to use uh, whatever hypervisor you want, probably. So um, the um, the appliance I have open right here. So inside this little box right here is a computer that's running inside my computer. And this is a computer that's running Fedora Linux. Fedora is a certain distribution of Linux. So if you're not familiar with Linux, uh, it's an operating system just like Windows or Macintosh. Um, and Linux, unlike Windows or Mac Macintosh has many different distributions. There are many different flavors to it. I guess 
in the same way that uh, Windows Vista is a little bit different than Windows 7, uh, Windows, uh, Linux Fedora is a little bit different than Linux Ubuntu. Um, so there, there are different flavors for, for each uh, uh, version of li Linux. Um, and uh, so the key um, it, right here is this IP address, which has been already configured for us. 192.168.119.128. And uh, if we open up a terminal here, um, in, your in this class, you'll probably become pretty familiar with terminal applications if you're, n if you're not already. Um, and right now, we're in a Linux environment. So if we type ls, it lists the contents of the directory. Um, and right now, we are in, if I, if I do PWD, that stands for Print Working Directory, you can see I'm in the folder jharvard, which is inside the folder home. And uh, so when I did ls up at the top, that listed the, the current files and folders that are inside the folder jharvard that's inside home. Um, and there are many more commands. Uh, that you'll need to get familiar with. If you're c curious about any of these commands that I've demonstrated here, you can type man, which stands for manual, and then the command. And then you get a long help page that tells you all of the switches that can tell you more information uh, than the default version of the command. So for example, this one right here, ls-a, that does not ignore entries starting with the dot, which is uh, a, a shortcut for this current directory. So if I do ls-a, then I see all the dot files. Another one that'll be really useful in this class is ls-l, which gives you the long listing for the directory. And in this case, uh, it gives you, over here at the left, the permissions of the file and the owner and the group and the size and the last modification date and the name. The permissions will become really important when you try to debug which, uh, the permissions, which are over here, will become really important when you try to debug what pages do and don't show up. Um, so normally, when you open the uh, when you open your appliance, it will probably um, it, it will probably not have a public HTML directory. You will have to create the directory, and the way that you create the directory is by typing mkdir. I'm going to create a temporary directory right now. TEMP, and if I type ls-la then or ls-l, then now you can see there's a folder, the temp folder, that I just created, and it has the these permissions, which are different than the public HTML permissions, and we'll deal more with permissions in another section once you already have the. Uh, the appliance and have played around with this. But in general, there's a mnemonic that uh, you'll want to commit to memory, um, which is that the number four stands for read permissions, and two stands for write, and one stands for execute. Um, so the permissions that you have or that you can assign are the sum all of all the permissions that you want. So for example, if I wanted to change the permissions on the temp directory so that uh, the, there are three relevant uh, people that can interact with this directory. There's the user, which comes first, the RWX. Then there's the group, which is the middle 
RWX. And then uh, there's everyone, like the permissions for e every person that could encounter this folder, which is the last, last triple of RWX. So whenever you indicate permissions, you indicate three numbers, which is a number, uh, each of which is a number between one and seven. And uh, for example, if I wanted the temp directory to have the same permissions as the public HTML directory, I'd want it to have 755. Because you can see the public HTML directory has read, write, execute for the, for the first bit, which is 4 plus 2 plus 1. And then for the m middle and the last users, for the group and for everyone, it has, well, I guess for that one, the, the group has execute and read permissions. So that would actually only be s 6. And then for the last one, or no, it has read and execute. So that's, yeah. So read plus execute is 5. So um, it, there's read and execute on the group, which is the middle one, and on the final bit, which is for everyone. So if I were to change the permissions on the temp directory with the chmod command, chmod 755 temp, then now temp has the same permissions as public HTML. So the reason why this is this is important is that um, when you go to this IP address, 192.168.119.128 slash, and then the username, which is jharvard, um, you are taken directly into the public HTML folder. CD stands for change directory. So I just change directory into the public HTML folder. And here you can see the S75 sections folder, which is just like what you see here. Um, so if I were to um, move the temporary directory I just created to this directory. Now you can see there's S75 sections and temp. And if I were to refresh this page, now I see the temp directory. And because I assigned it the same permissions, I should be able to go into it. Um, and I don't have anything in there currently. Um, so if you remember back to this image right here. The very first thing Apache does is uh, find what PHP file to render. Um, so if I go to, it, it automatically knows that, this server automatically knows that if you go to tilde and then a username, it goes to that user's public HTML folder, uh, which is at this address, home J Harvard public HTML. So that's what Apache and does in order to find, in order to map the tilde J Harvard to the public HTML folder. And from then on, it just goes inside the folders the way that you tell it to. So if I go inside temp and go inside temp, um, if I create an index.php file inside of this temp directory, then it, if there's either an index.php or an index.html, it will, Apache will naturally assume that is the one that you want to create. Uh, what we're seeing right here is the default Apache index. And uh, so if I create an, an index.php, uh, this is the default Apache index page for the temp folder. 
and if I create an index.php, it'll override this default one and, and display whatever the result of my PHP execution is. So I'm going to be using the uh, terminal editor vim to uh, edit index.php. And we'll just, I'm sure that uh, David did a little bit of this in his class as well. We'll just make a simple page. Um, So now, if I refresh this page, it actually shows me the result of uh, executing this PHP file. Now, there's no PHP code that's actually executed because we didn't include any uh, begin PHP execution or end PHP execution tags. Um, so the begin PHP execution tag is like that. Can you see that? OK. Um, so one of the most fundamental commands in PHP is, is echo. And you call echo uh, putting what you would like echoed out to the screen um, in, as a parameter to the function call. Um, so I'm going to uh, create a break. And then echo more content. And then I'll close the PHP tags. And this should echo more content out right there. Um, so one of the most important commands that you can learn about is PHP info. And uh, that tells you everything there is to know about uh, the version of PHP that you're running. Um, one of the first things that I do if I'm working on a new server is run this command in order to really find out um, what the server is capable of, um, because it changes with every installation of PHP and with every uh, a version of Apache and the parameters that it's installed with. So PHP info as a, as a function call uh, gives me this nice page that has um, all of these important val key value pairs um, like, uh, like display errors is on. Um, or and um, error reporting. Now this gives us a rather confusing integer for error reporting, um, but uh, we can find out what that is if we if we were really determined to. It's easiest. It's easier to set error reporting than it is to read it through this page. Um, so if you're If you're interested, if your version of PHP has any particular functionality, you can call the PHP info function and then use control F on your page in order to search for that particular parameter and then, uh, and then look for it. Um, so um, the uh, With variable names um, in PHP, uh, there are lots of things that are valid. Um, basically, anything that begins with a dollar sign and then an, uh, a letter or an underscore, um, these are all val valid variable names. Uh, I would recommend against using un underscores because PHP actually uses them internally in order to do its own 
uh, variables like uh, post, um, which is an, uh, a variable that contains a very special array. Um, did David talk about arrays at all in this last? So um, one really uh, uh, clever um, function is print r. And um, if you put uh, an array inside of print r, um, then it tells you what's inside of the array. Um, and in this one, it just displays an empty array. Um, why is that for dollar undersigned git? What's dollar undersigned git supposed to have inside of it? Yeah? Right. So I actually need, yes, uh, the, um, someone suggested that it should have the parameters following the URL. So this is actually the index.php page. And if I put um, key equals val and refresh the page, then now my array is updated with a key of the word key and the value val. Um, so I should be able to uh, create a new break and then I, I'm going to concatenate that break with um, dollar undersign get um, key. And then because val is stored inside the key key, uh, then it's printed out right there um, and, and concatenated to a break. Um, so uh, in order to uh, get beyond uh, git and post, which contain the, um, the information that is that Apache receives inside of the request, um, we need to incorporate sessions. And um, so um, the key to doing sessions is to, um, at the very beginning, before you echo out any content, you have to make sure that you call session underscore start. Um, and uh, this actually uh, makes it possible for you to use any of the uh, key value pairs um, that, uh, that you will then store inside the session variable. So the session variable is uh, dollar underscore session and um, I can store anything in a key value pair here. It, arrays in PHP let you store uh, numbers or strings or even other arrays in them. So you can have nested arrays. So you can use the session variable to literally store arrays of arrays of arrays in order to contain hierarchical information, if that's what you want to do. Um, so I'll. I'll store first name inside, uh, I'll use my name, Peter. And so um, if we go back to this page and refresh it, it says temporary page is working. And what has now happened is that uh, I have uh, 
I have created um, a cookie on my computer by my browser. Um, and that cookie contains a very long string of, of uh, numbers that uniquely identifies me. And that cookie that has that long number in it, um, there is a file, uh, there is a, a folder inside of Apache that has that same long number in it. And so then when I request this page again, it goes and uh, digs out that uh, folder and puts the stuff that's inside that folder stored in the server into the dollar underscore session variable for you to use. Um, so if I were to um, create um, uh, I'll call it after, well, in fact, we'll copy it. Copy. CP stands for copy, so I'm going to copy the index and call it index 02. And now um, I will not include these assignment statements. But I will you don't actually need these parentheses here for historical reasons. Um, these days, everything in PHP is done in an object-oriented and function-oriented way. But traditionally, you, you actually can just do this. Um, so now I have a page that is index 02. And if I go to index 02.php, I see Peter Knorr. And even though there's no assignment statement on this page, and the reason why is that in index.php, I stored those variables in this session folder. This one's called first name. This one's called last name. And when you call session start, uh, it, when you visit this page, index.php, it creates a cookie on your computer created by your browser. And that cookie is just a little file that has a long number in it. And at the very same time, it creates a folder on the server here in Fedora. Apache does this. And it has that same number in it. So then when I visit index 02, it, it sends the, the cookie that was created on my computer to the server. And it has that number in it. So Apache knows that it can look up inside that directory uh, and retrieve the information that was stored in a previous session. Yeah? If you had had a command like session in at the end of uh, index.php, uh, would it still have performed? Uh, or is there, is there such a command? Uh, so the question was if. If you were to um, call a command to end the session uh, before uh, the variables were stored, then would this retrieval be possible? After the variables were stored, but before you ran index of two. Yeah. Um, so um, let's see. I don't even think that that is a, a command. Um, what you can do is um, uh, that it's it's kind of tricky to um, 
uh, to actually delete all, to delete the entire session, you have to do several different things. Um, you can, uh, you can expire the cookie prematurely. Um, you can, um, let's see. Um, I'll, I'll actually have to get, I can't remember the syntax right now. Um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you with that comment. Um, the, it, and it is essential that you be able to do that, otherwise you wouldn't be able to log someone out. Um, the, uh, right now, if I visit this page, um, it will always say the name that was stored there unless I go into a separate cookie space. And this is where Chrome is especially efficient for um, developing because if you press Control Shift N, you can instantly get into a fresh cookie space. And um, if I go to the, uh, the same web page, you can see it, it says undefined index first name uh, in index 02 on line 11. So um, what we're seeing here are notices. Um, and you can see that the default error level in PHP is set up to actually tell you about the notices. Um, this is something you wouldn't want in production environments, obviously, because it would um, expose your server to vulnerabilities. Um, and you can control the error reporting, but um, because we're in a different cookie space here, then you're not, you know, this is what you would see once you, once you call that, that special command. Um, so, um, Let's try, um, uh, one thing that you can do is um, you can create a form uh, and uh, <coughs> here in uh, in index.php, the first one, um, if we create a form and action equals uh, index02.php um, and Can even you can even have a form submit to its own um, to to the actual page itself, um, or I believe um, you can even leave it blank and uh, it will it'll submit it to this one as well. Um, So if we go to index.php, um, we should create some uh, labels here. Um, So right now we need a submit 
um, I think that's how it is. So um, what I've just done is um, submitted the uh, first name and last name form elements uh, to the, uh, the git parameter and then printed out the git parameter. So this page is actually ran twice. The very first time, uh, it act print r actually is, um, you, you can see that my uh, name is actually appended up here um, when I actually hit submit. So right now there's n there are no parameters. And then when I hit submit, the parameters show up and print r records that the variables are, are actually submitted. Um, so uh, because you can get access two variables this way, um, you can then store um, the uh, value of getting it from the git super global. Um, so what this will do, um, well, maybe somebody else can explain it. Um, what, what, will, what will this uh, enable us to do? Yeah. Right. So it, in it uh, it enables us to take the first and the last name from these two text boxes, store them into the session, and then if we load this page, whatever we type in here should show up uh, on the second page because it's in the same session. Um, so I'm going to put random phrase here, and it st should store it in the session. And I have a syntax error, unexpected less than sign on line 12. Um, so the problem here is that I didn't echo this br tag out. And so it was confused because I was in the middle of PHP mode. And it needs a quote on that same line, or a, a semicolon, in order to terminate the statement. So now random phrase appears in the session. Um, so uh, this gives you an example of how you can um, take input from the user, store it into the session, and then retrieve that later. Um, and because each cookie has an expiration date, you can store how long that's stored on the server. Um, you can have it store a month. You can have it store a year. You can have it store for 10 years. Um, ultimately, though, it's up to the, uh, the user how long that uh, that cookie is on their computer, it's possible for them to delete that cookie and, uh, and then that information would not be stored persistently, which is why uh, we have to log in periodically to some services. Um, uh, and because you can store arrays inside of arrays, you could even have a person key inside of session. And then in each person could be an array where there's a key, first, first name, and last name. 
and where, uh, or maybe the uh, session key could be people, and then you could have actually store a bunch of people. Um, you can store a lot of uh, a lot of things into session. It's actually just um, limited by the file size. Um, you know, the, the memory is limited to the, the file size of the computer that's, that's running it. Um, so um, I think that, that pretty much illustrates it. In order to use post, um, then you would, um, I think it's, is it type equals post? Is it method? Yeah, method. So if we do post, then um, you can see that this, uh, that didn't do it, method. So um, what you should do whenever you're using these, uh, whenever you're referencing something that could be coming in from the outside world, um, you need to use is set um, in, order, in order to see if it is set. Either that or use the at symbol in order to indicate that you want the errors to be suppressed if that key is not there. Because this is an array, this is a variable that refers to an array, and if that array doesn't have the key first name, then you'll get a notice. Um, so now that I've put the at symbol there, then it won't complain if that, if that key is, is not present. Um, so um, in Chrome, um, the I don't think you can pause in the middle of post, but um, I'm sure David showed last time that you can view the different requests that have been um, done by the page. And when you're using JavaScript uh, in order to indi indicate the, in order to retrieve information from the server, you can press record and then have JavaScript do some executions, and each re request will appear right here. Um, and um, so, because I had the record button on, you can see the headers here. Um, there's form data where first name is random and last name is string, and um, the um, it's sent as post, which means that nothing was stored in the actual uh, URL request, um, but it's still in plain text and um, trivially observed. Uh, it's, uh, it's slightly more difficult to uncover a password if it's post, but it's by no means secure. Um, the so now you can see first name is random and last name is string. Um, and now first name is another random and last name is string. And even if I go to index 01 or uh, index 02, then I'm doing something wrong. Where? On the left side, 
Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, instead of underscore get, it should be underscore post, because it's no longer retrieving it through the URL. Um, so if I go back and submit that, and then go to index 02.php, then now my name appears. So I think that covers most of these things, um, except for how to manually create, uh, how to manually delete the cookie. Um, yeah, that will, does that do everything? Uh, I think the effect for the user is the same. So now if we go to index 02, then these are undefined. So for the user, session destroy called at the end, or called anywhere, um, like dis destroys the availability of the number. Do you know if that actually destroys the actual information on the? Yeah. Um, uh, the cookie. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if session destroy actually s expires the cookie for the user. But yeah, so this should um, log the user out. Um, if we wanted to do um, a password, um, you can do, I think it's type equals password. Yeah, so if you do type equals password, then you can store, you, you can make it so that it doesn't appear on the screen. Um, so um, th that's at least how you could implement some primitive pa uh, password uh, functionality using session. Um, so uh, what we could do is um, put at the top of this page, um, password, it's like a, a secret password equals um, trust no one. Um, and then you could say if um, Um, so here the form is not going to a different page, but if we submit it to index02.php with a method of post, um, and we change um, this to 
password um, so that it matches this post password field. We'll even print it out. Um, so here I got in because I used the trust no one uh, password. But if I use a different password, and here maybe this will be easier to see if I delete that type. So that actually did not work. Let's see. Um, the name is password. If we I'm yeah. So um, I didn't tr test for equality. Instead, I actually um, assigned. I overwrote the password key. Um, so if I do this. You did not enter the right password, but if I enter trust no one, then it says you got in. Um, and, um, and then it says undefined index, first name, uh, not sure why it says undefined index, first name. Oops. Oh, yeah, because it's um, in the session, if I actually said. Yeah. Um, so um, do you guys have any questions about how to use um, the get super global, the post super global, or the session super global, or what a super global is? Is that pretty clear? Um, you can store um, tons and tons of information inside the session. Um, if you want something um, bigger or more rigorous, you can um, write it to a file. And we'll cover that in um, future, uh, future s sections. Um, the, I will add uh, these two files to um, the uh, to this um, GitHub page, and um, you will be able. Git is pre-installed on the appliance, so when you get the appliance, you'll be able to um, run these examples. Um, write in your own appliance and use the same URLs I have in class. Um, so I think that's pretty much um, everything that we really had to get through today. Um, you may encounter one issue when you start playing with this, um, which is uh, the permissions issue. If I were to create um, uh, let's say I wanted to create another directory. Um, um, and I make an index.html page. Um, let's just see if this works. So now I should be able to go to, um, I'm in home, J Harvard, public HTML, temp2. So I should be able to go to inside the J Harvard directory. I should be able to go to temp2. But it says 
you don't have access to temp2 on this server. So the first thing you want to do is do ls-l and make sure that the permissions are right. Um, in order for directories to show up, they need, at the very least, execute permissions. Because um, you and to execute a directory means to be able to go inside of it. Um, it it's different than, you don't necessarily need read permissions or write permissions. Read permissions on a directory means that you can list the files inside of it. Um, and write means that you can um, write, you can, you can touch a new file inside of it. Um, but you want to make sure that at the very least you can, um, uh, everyone can execute it. So um, if you, it, in, in general, 755 will be fine for directories. If you change the permissions on temp2 to 755, then you'll still encounter this issue, which is that now we can get inside temp2 and find out that there's an index.html page. But if I go inside temp2, I can see that the index.html page only has read-write permissions. Now, if I do ls-l on the temp directory that we were working in, I can see index.php and index02.php only had read-write permissions. So why is it that I can enter these and execute them just fine, but not this one? Does anyone have an idea? So, What's happening here is that um, Apache, if you go back to this, this page, um, Apache, the very first thing it does is try to find a file to handle the request. And so um, if I go to jharvard slash temp2, the, the first thing it looks for is index.php. And if index.php isn't there, it looks for an index.html. Um, and if it actually has the suffix HTML, then it assumes, then Apache assumes that there's no PHP that needs to be executed and it actually delivers the, the HTML file up the way that it is on the server. And so as a result, you, Everyone needs read permissions in order to read an HTML file or in order to read a JPEG, like an image. Um, so you would need to chmod this so that everyone has the read bit enabled. Uh, and now we can access it. Um, this will probably cause you a, f a few headaches the first time that you're uh, working with the appliance if you've never dealt with Linux permissions before. Um, but again, that the 644 permissions is only necessary for things where everyone needs to be able to read them. We're using uh, a type of PHP that the PHP is actually executed as you, the user, and you are J Harvard. Um, so it just needs the, uh, these first read-write bits to be enabled. Um, are there any questions about that? I think that pretty much covers it. Um, I'll make sure that these are up on, um, on Git by tomorrow, and um, I'll make sure that the slideshow is um, accessible through there as well. Thanks so much.